When you seek adventure and follow your passion, you can experience the most exciting moments of your life. Unfortunately, when your passion is caving or mountain climbing, disaster can strike. And that is exactly what happens in these next three stories. Inge Marek Retterson grew up spending a lot of time in the mountains and really appreciates the beautiful country of Iceland where he was born. Iceland is very unique as it is located so geographically north, the sun does not completely set at night during the summer. The amount of attractions packed into a country even smaller than Greece is very impressive and you can drive around the entire country in a week. He is well liked and has the respect of his colleagues in the Icelandic mountain trucking community. He would sometimes take his three children, along with his wife, on hiking trips around the island to see the spectacular natural scenery. His family would not be surprised to have him take extended trips to explore the volcanoes, glaciers, impressive lava fields, and mountains of Iceland. Even though all of these sites are wonderful, Inge Mar's favorite place to explore is the glaciers. The lore for him was the fact that many of the glaciers are in remote and isolated areas of the country. There is always a chance for him to discover a new glacier that no human has ever set foot in before. A glacier is a persistent body of dense ice that is constantly moving under its own weight. A glacier forms where the accumulation of snow exceeds its ablation over many years, often centuries. Ablation is the removal of snow and ice by melting or evaporation, typically from a glacier or iceberg. When Inge Mar found out about the newly discovered cave in Blagniasigut, an outlet glacier of Hafsigut in South Iceland, he immediately decided he was going to explore it. Hofsjökull Glacier is the third largest glacier in Iceland and is located above a dormant volcano. The area is known for significant geological activity. The cave was discovered in 2017 by the staff at Kalingafurt Central Highland Center. The cave, which is far away from any roads, can only be accessed on heavy-duty off-road mountain trucks. It is believed the cave was most likely created in connection with a small glacial outburst flood. The area is known for geothermal activity. Scientists believe the geothermal activity in the region could easily increase, destabilizing the cave as well as rising the level of poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas in the cave. Some parts of the cave roof seem to be unstable. People should under no circumstance enter the cave without an experienced guide and gas detector. The National Broadcasting Service, RUV, in Iceland reports that a group of mountaineers explored the cave and found an extended 490 feet or 150 meters beneath the glacier. A strong smell of sulfur filled the cave, a sure sign of significant geothermal activity. There is sometimes a high amount of toxic gas in this cave. When the gas is high, it can cause respiratory problems and permanent damage to the eyes if people spend more time than one hour in the gas. The police in South Iceland had issued warnings to people not to enter the cave without gas detectors to monitor the levels of poisonous gases which build up in the caves formed by geothermal activity. Several groups have visited the cave since it was discovered. A man who recently visited the cave told RUV that a seven-year-old girl who was with the family passed out due to the gas. They were walking with a large group in the cave, taking photographs when the seven-year-old girl sat down on a ledge. Her mother noticed that the girl was not doing well and asked if she wanted to leave the cave. She took her eyes off the girl for one moment, and when she looked back at the girl, she had passed out. You could only see the whites of her eyes, and she was emitting this raspy sound because she obviously had some trouble breathing. They grabbed her by the arms and ran out with her. When they were about halfway out of the cave, she suddenly looked at her father and asked why they were running with her. She was able to come back to reality and be aware of her surroundings when she had more of the oxygen to breathe outside of the cave. In late February 2018, Inge Mar 
went on an exploring trip to check out the Hasvingut Glacier with a Belgian couple. Inge Mar first entered, accompanying the Belgian couple and two other travelers who had visited the cave on their own. He was carrying a gas detector to monitor the levels of dangerous gases inside the cave. The readings on the gas detectors showed low levels of poisonous geothermal gases inside. The gas levels seemed to be low, so they decided to make the dangerous trek to Hasvingut because the inside of the cave was like nothing they had ever seen before. This cave was stunning. It had eerie, swelling blue domes that resembled the underside of a rapid river, flash frozen. As the sun shines on the thin roof of the ice cave, Multicolored lights dance across, creating a mesmerizing glow. After having guided the people around the ice cave, it was time to leave before poisonous gases were detected. Inge Mar had escorted them out safely, but after that, he entered the cave a second time to check for something that someone in the group had left behind. The group waited for a while, but when Inge Mar did not return, some of the people decided to go after him. The people then re-entered the cave carrying a gas detector. The detector now showed dramatically elevated levels of poisonous gases. Rather than enter the deadly air in the cave, the people then requested assistance. Several people who were intimately familiar with the area were close at the scene and could assist the search and rescue teams. Due to the remoteness of the ice cave and bad weather, including very limited visibility, it took the rescue team several hours to arrive at the scene. Readings showed very high levels of poisonous gases in the cave. The search and rescue teams had to carry their own air tanks into the cave. The ICE SAR team finally found Inge Mar lying at the bottom of a long ice slope next to one of the ice cave walls. He appeared to have passed out or slipped on the ice, sliding down an icy slope. The cause of Inge Mar's death has not been determined conclusively, but it is suspected that the poisonous gases caused him to suffocate. When it comes to climbing mountains, it takes a very special kind of person to do it. Austrian climber Matthias Rimmel was one of the climbers who loved the thrill. He is from Tyrol, Austria, and in the early 2000s turned to guiding in the Alps, thus becoming the fourth generation of his family to lead adventurers in mountains near the Swiss-Italian border. He became a professional mountain guide in 2015. In the same year, he completed military service and Matthias switched to being a freelance ski instructor in Austria and outside Europe. At 35, he was happy as a carpenter, but his true calling was the outdoors and exploring technical climbing routes in the Alps. He is a member of the Arlberg Mountain Rescue Service, a certified mountain ski and canoeing guide, a ski and snowboard instructor, and an authorized avalanche blasting agent. Matthias is one of the few people that led long technical hiking and climbing tours. Matthias had a goal to climb seven summits and even had the accomplishment of summiting Mount Kilimanjaro. His next major goal was to summit Denali, the highest mountain peak in North America, 20,310 feet or 6,190 meters above sea level. Denali is the third most prominent and third most isolated peak on Earth, after Mount Everest and Aconcagua. The headwall on the route to the 20,300 foot summit has been the site of many deadly falls over the years. Temperatures on the peak remain bitterly cold, even with the spring arriving in much of the rest of Alaska. A climber, Andy Hutton, says mountaineering is a dangerous sport. It's a sport you cannot take lightly. He knows this because he is a mountaineer, and it does not come easy to reach the summit in any situation. He also says Denali seems to be an easy technical mountain climb, but the wind and weather can easily defeat even the most experienced of climbers. Denali is especially hard because it has its own rules. In such conditions, an injured climber does not have much chance of surviving too long. 13 climbers have died in falls along the West Buttress route, which is the most popular route for Denali climbers. 
the majority of the deaths occur on the descent. Matthias decided that he would make this climb to summit Denali alone and take the west buttress route. He knew this route was the most dangerous, but was not concerned about the dangers due to the sheer amount of experience and confidence he has built up over his lifetime. He didn't bring much gear because his strategy was to climb alpine style, which means to travel fast with relatively light gear. It is a strategy that works fine as long as one keeps moving, but can present difficulties if a climber is slowed or injured by weather. The weather in the Alaskan range is often the biggest difficulty mountaineers face. It changes in an instant. Matthias left his camp with his goal in mind to reach the summit in five days, even though he carried enough fuel and food to last 10 days. For reference, the average Denali expedition is 17 to 21 days for a round trip with climbers making the summit on day 12 or 13, according to the National Park Service. On April 27, 2022, Matthias set out to summit Denali. He started at the Cahiltna Glacier Base Camp at 7,200 feet and eventually made it to his next camp at 14,000 feet in not too much time. Summit temperatures were reported but pushing near 40 degrees below zero on Friday night and the Saturday forecast predicted a high of 26 degrees below zero with 20 to 35 mile an hour winds, driving the wind chill temperature down to 63 degrees below zero. Matthias had not been heard from since calling a friend on a satellite phone to report that he was just below the Denali Pass on Saturday. Radio silence followed for three days before his friend contacted the park service to check on Matthias. A friend was trying to connect with him during the climb, and they weren't having any luck. This made them extremely worried, and so they called the authorities. On Wednesday, a pilot and mountaineering ranger in a National Park Service helicopter looked for Matthias. Intermittent clouds didn't allow a thorough search, and they didn't see any signs of him. They eventually found his tent at 14,000 feet but didn't observe any recent activity around the tent. Not to mention, the weather changes everything. High winds and poor weather prevented the helicopter from landing at the campsite, but the helicopter did return a couple days later when the weather was better. Rangers confirmed that Matthias had not returned to the tent. Clouds prevented the helicopter from flying above 17,200 feet that day so the park rangers decided to wait one more day before resuming the search. On Friday evening, Matthias's body was spotted in the fall zone below Denali Pass during the aerial search. His body was spotted right at 18,200 feet. Matthias likely fell on a steep traverse between Denali Pass at 18,200 feet and the 17,200 foot plateau a notoriously treacherous stretch of the West Buttress Route. A year earlier, a Colorado skier died after plummeting into a crevasse while descending down the Eldridge Glacier just east of Denali. James Mitchell, a 23-year-old chemist, is extremely passionate about caving and spends most of his free time exploring new caves. He is respected in the caving community, even though he is very young. James won the annual award from the National Speleological Society for outstanding scientific papers. He planned to spend the next day exploring a nearby cave with two friends from the Boston Grotto Club, a nurse named Hetty Miller and Charles Bennett, a Harvard postgraduate. James and his two friends arrived in Herkimer County, upstate New York, to explore Schroeder's Pants Cave. This cave was discovered 18 years earlier by Goodell Corners in Herkimer County, New York. It was initially explored in the 1950s by Herbert W. Schroeder and George Lyon, teachers at the high school in Dodgeville, New York, and named for Mr. Schroeder after he tore his pants on the initial exploration of the cave. In preparation for the caving exploration, James visited Lyon's grandfather, George Leon, the man who discovered the cave with Herb Schroeder in 1947. But no one warned James and his friends that the temperatures earlier that week had hovered around freezing. Modern cavers 
generally wear a fleece undersuit covered with a waterproof PVC layer, but this was not always the case. In the 1960s, it started to become more mainstream to understand the risk of hypothermia in caving. It was not common knowledge to realize when you stop moving, you stop generating lots of heat, and that's when you're at most risk for becoming hypothermic. Most cavers in these times would enter deep caves in only jeans and cotton overalls. On February 13, 1965, James and his three friends entered the cave. Though it was snowing on the day that they entered the cave, temperatures actually had been warmer than much of the previous week. James had planned to visit George Leone that morning to discuss the cave. George Leone owns the land that lies beneath the cave. But unfortunately, he was not home at this time, and thus he was unable to warn the young cavers about the thick streams of icy meltwater that poured through the caverns that they were about to enter. Schroeder's Pants Cave is not a cave for beginners. There are many areas of the cave where you can get stuck, and dangerous water flows are running throughout the cave, especially with the ice melting. Even with all of these challenges, the group managed to squeeze through a series of pitch black, narrow passages until they reached an open chamber. At the center of this dark chamber, a vertical shaft plunged 80 feet down into another dark chamber. A small river was racing throughout this shaft, at the rate of about 10 gallons every minute. Undeterred, James, armed with a foot strap and a waist harness, fixed his safety line and began to slowly lower himself down the shaft in an attempt to reach the deeper part of the cave. But then suddenly he stopped. The line had caught, trapping one of his arms. He tried to pull himself loose and keep descending, but the equipment would not budge. He was stuck. Still calm, his head doused relentlessly with freezing water, he began climbing back up the rope. But with his one hand that was free, he could not gain any grip with all the cold and wet. For about 45 minutes, Charles and Hetty tried to haul James, who weighed 182 pounds or 82 kilograms, back up into the higher chamber. The two of them could not manage to get James loose. James screamed out to them that they should not worry and that he would be able to get himself out. He continued to try to get himself unstuck, but nothing was working. And all of a sudden, he started to lose the ability to speak from the sheer amount of cold that he was experiencing. Finally, Charles climbed out of the cave to get help. A National Grotto Rescue team member flew out of the Air Force One unit in Washington, D.C., and within hours, James' harrowing experience had become a top news story, coast to coast. But when the rescue team finally arrived, they began pulling on the rope and soon realized that James had died and they were recovering a corpse. James' death made two things clear to cavers across the world. Every cave complex needs trained rescue teams stationed nearby. Having them in Washington, D.C. is not good enough if you're going down in a hole in another state. Second, cold water rather than narrow passages or falling rocks is actually the greatest danger in cave exploration. James' death did not change the rules of caving, but there is an agonizing coda to his story. After three days of attempting to haul James' body back up the shaft, the rescue team decided that they would have to drill through the rock to make more space. As they attempted this, part of the cave collapsed, making further rescue efforts unsafe. Dirt was coming down the shaft and they had to get out of there, and so, reluctantly, the team decided that the bottom of Schroeder's Pants Cave would have to serve as James's grave. The entrance was blasted shut with dynamite, to prevent future mishaps, and a memorial stone was laid to mark the events of that day. While the story continued to be told with reverence, and many lessons from it were gratefully learned, the decision to seal the cave became a source of some controversy. One member at the National Speleological Society's board says that he's sorry for James's death, but he also admits that he's sad that the cave has been gated for so many years because of one man's mishap. He wonders why all others that choose to explore this cave must be denied the opportunity because of one person's error in judgment. After three years of planning, Christian Lyon, grandson of George, the cave's original discoverer, gathered a rescue team to get James's body out of the cave. 
After six hours of work, they finally managed to bring James's bones back to the surface. It was quite meaningful to the cave rescue teams to see what actually needed to have happen to remove him from the cave. With the new technology that the rescue teams had, it was no longer impossible to bring James's body back to the surface. I just want to say thank you for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. I also have many other disaster videos on my channel that you might be interested in checking out.